you're making your way in your copy of God's Word to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 as we continue to look at Jesus' sermon here recorded for us in Luke chapter 6. Of course, we're taking a life-changing look at the life of Christ. We've been doing so lately by considering His words that He once preached on the side of a mountain. This morning, our focus, our attention is going to be on verses 39 through 45. So Luke chapter 6, verses 39 through 45. I'm fearful, though, when we hit verses 39 through 45, that we might miss the point that Jesus is trying to make. And so I'm going to back us up as we read to verse 27, so that we can remember and be reminded that Jesus, in fact, is preaching a sermon. This is one sermon that he's preached And the words that we're going to focus on this morning come immediately after the words that we have been considering lately. So look at Luke chapter 6, verse 27, but again, our focus this morning will be verses 39 through 45. These are God's words. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If... You love those who love you. What benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged, Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And now our text for this morning. He also told them this parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not fall into will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. For no good tree bears bad fruit. Nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. May the Lord bless the reading of his word, and Lord, we do beg your wisdom as we work through these words. 
You know, as we've worked through Jesus' sermon here in Luke chapter 6, he has been describing who and what we are becoming as his followers. And that's good information for us to know. He's describing who and what he is making us. He is giving us the details on what changes he, through your circumstances and his truth, how he's shaping us into people that look like him. In Isaiah 64, verse 8, Isaiah said, But now, O Lord, we are the clay, you are our potter, and we are the work of of your hand. Christian, God is shaping you. His fingerprints are all over your life, your circumstances, and what he's instructing you with through his word. Now, what is he shaping us to look like? Well, Romans 8 29 gives us a general idea. It tells us that we have been predestined by God to be transformed or to be shaped into the image of his son. But what does that look like, practically speaking? What should I look like as a follower of Jesus? What should I sound like? What should I be like? How am I supposed to Treat people? How am I to respond when people poke me, when they offend me, when they sin against me? Now, all of these questions, they can be answered with a single word love. Love. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Church, I cannot, for whatever reason, let go of this passage, this teaching by Jesus that calls us not only to love, but he very clearly instructs us on how to love. According to Jesus in this chapter, how do we love? We do good. To everyone. From our closest friend to our most distant enemy. When people cut us, we bleed patience and kindness. We show mercy. We show mercy to the undeserving, the people who don't deserve our mercy. We're quick to give it. We forgive. We let go, even as God in Christ has forgiven us. I heard a sermon this last week, two weeks ago, actually. The preacher said, Listen, it's as simple as this. It's not this simple, but it's, I like his point. His point is all of our relational problems that we experience in life, whether it's with your wife, your kids, the person at, the wor- at work, whatever it might be, there's one solution that would make it all go away. Forgive. Throw a blanket of love over that offense and walk away. 
And Jesus teaches us here, rather than, do, or rather than doling out revenge, that revenge that our flesh so desperately craves, we instead bless. We generously give. We generously bless even those who poke us. So in a nutshell, the whole law of God, as Paul would put it, can be summed down to one word. The work of God in us can be summed down into one word. And what word is that? Love. Love. The whole law can be summarized in two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, everything you've got, and love everyone else, even as you love yourself. So Jesus has been very practically driving home in his sermon what he's doing in your life. You say, why is my, why is my life so full of trial? Why, why is my life so full of difficult people? It's because God is giving you opportunity to love them as he loves you. Love. Which brings us to this morning's text. Watch out, Christians. Watch out, followers of Jesus. Beware. Beware of spiritual leaders who do not love well. They are blind. And they will lead you into a pit. You will become like them. They go around trying to fix others while they have a huge problem that is a thousand times bigger than the problems that they see in other people. They do not bring good and love out of the treasure chests of their hearts. No, such spiritual leaders are thorny. They prick people. They constantly wound them. So beware of spiritual leaders who do not love well, who seem to have never experienced for themselves the tender mercies of God, who judge, who condemn, who do not forgive and are stingy with their gifts. Loved Beware of spiritual leaders, so-called spiritual leaders, who do not love like Jesus loves. Why? Because if you follow their lead, you will become like them and not like Jesus. Jesus makes this argument using several word pictures in this text. These word pictures are going to serve as our talking points this morning. So word picture number one is of the blind leading the blind. The blind leading the blind. We read of it in verse 39. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? Well, can a blind man lead a blind man? Of course. But it's probably not a good idea. Will they both fall into a pit? Well, I suppose they'll fall into a pit, especially if there are a lot of pits out there. And as we read scripture, we learn that there are plenty of deep and dangerous pits all 
around. By the way, the word pit here, it doesn't simply mean a ditch. It refers to a mammoth hole. Church, what is Jesus getting at with this word picture? You see, when you consider the context of his sermon, the flow of his sermon, what's he saying? He's saying that the unloving are blind guides. And that if you follow such a person, it is not only foolishness on your part, it is also dangerous. Paul had something of this in mind when he wrote to the Corinthian church. We read in 1 Corinthians 13, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and I understand all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. Is Paul trying to undermine speaking in tongues? Is he trying to undermine knowledge and prophecy and understanding all mysteries and faith? Is he he trying to diminish those things? No, those are good things. What's he doing? He's elevating love. And what we tend to do is we tend to stay on these base levels while ignoring the love aspects. He says, if I give away All I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. So let's be reminded. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on having its own way. It is not irritable. It is not resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Church family, a preacher may have all kinds of knowledge about the Bible. The Pharisees did. A preacher might know a whole lot of theology. The Pharisees did. A preacher might appeal to your morals and ethics. The Pharisees did. A preacher may be well-spoken, dogmatic, persuasive, and present reasonable arguments. No doubt the Pharisees did all of these things. But if a man or a woman does not embody, resonate, possess, and demonstrate the love of Christ, He or she is blind, and they will lead you into the same loveless, dark pit in which they find themselves. These three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Do your spiritual leaders bring you the love of Christ? Which leads us to Jesus' second word picture. 
The teacher and the disciple. The teacher and the disciple, verse 40. A disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. You need to remember education in the day of Jesus was a lot different than it looks today. The teacher-pupil relationship, it was very personal. There were no books that people could check out from the library. There were no instructional videos to watch on YouTube. They simply didn't have these things. If you were going to learn from a teacher, you needed to be with the teacher. And the teacher taught. And like a sponge, you soaked it up. You didn't take a 50-minute class and then switch rooms when the bell rang and switch teachers. You had one teacher that you would walk behind as a disciple and you would listen as the teacher taught. And you didn't bounce around from teacher to teacher. In other words, there was a whole lot riding on the teacher that you chose. So Jesus, in effect, is saying, don't pick the wrong teacher. Because if you pick a blind guide, you'll end up in a pit. Which, by the way, is not only dangerous for you, It's dangerous for the people you lead or will someday lead. Why? Because everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher, which means not only will you take on the characteristics of the blind guide that you're following, so will the people that you're leading. Loved one, the person that you are becoming today, it matters. It matters to the people around you. Elders, deacons, it matters to your church family. Husbands, future husbands, it matters to your wife. Parents, it matters to your kids. Sunday school teachers, youth leaders, Bible study leaders, disciples, it matters. It matters because everyone, when he is fully trained, will be just like his teacher. Your followers will be just like you some day. And so I need to ask, what kind of teacher are you? What kind of teacher are you becoming? Husbands, are you worth imitating? Parents, are you what you want your children to become? Pastors, elders, can you say along with Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Loved ones, we must not be blind to our own sin, to our own lack of love and the very real damage that that sin and that lack of love causes to those who are around us, the people to whom God has placed the calling and responsibility for us to lead. We must honestly examine ourselves Confess our weaknesses and lead by example in what it looks like to be a sinner who is wholly dependent upon Jesus Christ for grace 
and mercy. People, our families, our church, our friends, our loved ones, they do not need us to act like we have our act together. They do not need us to act out of arrogance or protection of our reputation or a display of self-righteousness as if we have it all together. No, our loved ones, they need us to show what it looks like for a sinner to find the mercy of God and to live there and to love him as he loves us. Because our students will become just like us. Which leads to our third word picture. The speck in the log. The speck in the log, verses 41 and 42. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? And do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck that is in your eye, or take out the speck that is in your own eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Church, if we're going to be helpful spiritual leaders to those around us, then we must, we must be willing to do the hard work of self-examination and repentance. We must be willing to do the hard work of self-examination and repentance. And most of us, if not all of us, are familiar with the word picture that Jesus paints for us here. We already know that a speck, it refers to a small flake of sawdust. And we know that the word log refers to a pretty big log. A big, thick, heavy-duty log that people would have used back then as the centerpiece of a building or a house. Kind of like a modern-day telephone pole. Jesus here is lightening the mood a little bit. He's using humor. He's using a word picture of something that is actually rather ridiculous. Who goes around with a telephone pole sticking out of their face when they try to help somebody else with a piece of sawdust? It's utterly ridiculous. But he's teaching us a valuable lesson. Without self-examination, without humble repentance before our God, this is precisely how we walk around in our day-to-day lives, even as we seek to be helpful. Why do our relationships struggle? It's because we fail to love people as Jesus loves us. And I think because of the context, it's, it, we can easily draw the parallel between walking around with a log in our eye with the fact that we tend to not do what Jesus has de- done in his sermon. We judge. We condemn. We come down hard on people. We don't forgive. And so we grow bitter. Suddenly we grow stingy and we're not giving to the person what they need, what they require from us. And then we pretend like that's not what we're doing. We have telephones for poles for eyeballs. 
Jesus' eyes, his eyes, when he saw people that were hurting, his eyes produced tears of tender mercy. Our eyes have the tendency to grow cottonwoods. Is it any wonder he calls us blind? Church, we have the tendency to live our lives blind, stuck in a pit, swinging cottonwoods, pretending like we're not. And so the doctor this morning is giving us our medicine. You see, when I fail, and I do this often, when I fail to face the dreadfulness of my own heart. When I am unwilling to admit that the seeds of every sin known to man are planted inside of me. When I fail to recognize the fact, Paul's statement, that when it comes to you and me, that I win the competition of being the chief of sinners. In that relationship, when I fail to do that, then I blindly, arrogantly beat the other person up with my beam and pretend I'm not. And so do you. If that's our approach, friends, if that's our natural, sinful inclination, that natural way of doing things as men and women who are affected by sin, then what kind of teachers and leaders are we if we are not constantly going to the exam room and examining our own hearts with tears of repentance. Can I remind you of some hard words that Jesus says in Matthew 23? Starts with some comfort. Let me give you some comfort. He says, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself, he'll be humbled. But whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The thing about Matthew 23 is he's speaking to the Pharisees. And so he says in verse 13, but woe to you. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Can I just remind you of something? You, he, you shut the kingdom in people's faces. What's the kingdom? As Jesus goes proclaiming the kingdom, so much of it is the proclamation of his rule, his reign. And what does he rule and reign by? His word. And how does he summarize his law? Love God and love people. These teachers were shutting people out from the love of God and the love that God wants us to experience with one another. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, he goes on in verse 15. Hypocrites, for you travel across the sea as a missionary and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Why? It's absence, absent of love. The love of God. And so he says, woe to you, blind guides, you blind fools. Jesus 
Jesus is shaping us, church. You know why we, he's shaping us? Because we need it. He's in the business of turning your natural, your natural way of doing things upside down. And if we're ever going to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate, to bless those who curse, to pray for those who abuse and not judge them or condemn them, but forgive them and give them blessing and show them mercy, then we must first realize that we too are men and women who are in need of great mercy. Love and mercy. And that's not something that applies just to your past and the moment you became a Christian. No, we live a life that is in constant need of God's mercy, love, and forgiveness. And until we take off the blinders and remove the planks from our eyes and we see the great need that we have, which Jesus has granted to us in the gospel, until we come to that kind of sight, we'll never love like he loves. And so Jesus invites us this morning, take the log out of your own eye. And then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Word pictures four and five. Word pictures four and five. We can handle both of them together. Word picture number four, four is the good tree and the bad tree. Word picture number five is the good treasure And the evil treasure, it's found in verses 43 through 45. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush, a thorn bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks Jesus here calls us one final time to make sure that the leaders that we place over us submit to and become like are good Honestly ask yourself the question, what kind of fruit do your spiritual leaders produce? Good or bad? Are they thorn bushes or fruit producers? How about their treasure? Do they bring the good treasure of Jesus Christ to you? Out of the treasure chest of their hearts? Or do they, in their teaching, in their preaching, in their leading, do they bring you something else? Because you will know them by their fruit. Do they know? Do they trust? Do they reflect the love of God? Do they teach you with not only their words, but with their lives, what it looks like to love their enemies? To do good to those who hate them. To bless those who curse them. To pray for those who abuse them. Church, do they preach 
not only with their mouths, but with their lives, how to be merciful, forgiving, generous, kind. Do your spiritual leaders, do they know the love of Jesus? Can you follow them to Jesus? And do they take you to Jesus often? Paul says, we proclaim him. Teaching every man, correcting every man that we might present every man mature, complete in Christ. I trust you found this helpful. I don't know how to land this plane. Can we just pray? I don't know how to land this plane. Church, look to the one who is greater than everything in every way, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Father, rescue us from the blind. May we be men and women who are eager about this work of self-examination, getting the plank, removing the planks from our own eyes, Lord, knowing that when our kids, shoot, when, whoever we lead, when they're fully trained, they're going to be like us. So God, may we take this shaping that you're, you have in our lives, this transforming that you're doing, may we take it seriously. Weed our hearts from the thorn bushes. Produce in us, Lord, hearts that reflect the love of Christ. We thank you for this word. It's a hard word, Lord. We're able to receive it because we know that there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And we know, Lord, that this is your good work in us. And so we embrace it. May we repent. In Christ's name, amen.